Hi, I'm Linda. I have a Scottish accent because I'm from Motherwell, which is in the west coast of Scotland. And I've been here 11 years, 3 months, 24 days in London. <laughs> but we're not tired. <laughs> um, so I've been in London for quite some time. My accent hasn't changed. If I get so fast, you cannot understand what I'm saying. Please do shout. Um, my work is based on looking at materials, the craft practices, the historical and social context, and producing projects that are um, uh, sensitivity or the old narratives. And I have a number of different strands in my practice. Um, today I was asked to speak about how I manage the different types of work in versus public and commercial um, work and how this has kind of come about. So the easiest thing for me to do is really just walk you through each of the different strands of my work and kind of a little bit of a story of how I've, I've traveled through the last 10 years of doing each of them. Um, so I started by um, coming to London to do my master's at St. Martin's. I studied before in Dundee and then studied textile design. And I came here to do my master's and uh, in, in textiles in, in a course called uh, Textile Futures at St. Martin's. And I finished that with a good kind of film, um, which was really quite an eye opener for my mother when she came to see the master show. I think. <laughs> so I kind of made a way to different work from that, that uh, course. And in parallel with my work, as soon as I graduated, I became a technician in a print studio, then a workshop manager, then an associate lecturer, and then a lecturer in Germany, and now a lecturer in St. Martin's, um, where I'm based two and a half days a week. So all the way through making work, I've had other jobs and other work um, in parallel with my practice. And I think that to begin with, making work for other people or working in an arts organization like a print studio um, really grew my practice. I learned a lot from working and meeting artists who were already in practice and quite different practices from myself. And then commissioning me to make artists wallpapers for them also challenged my work a lot and I learned work that I would normally have um, made myself, uh, a lot of things from that. So I think that originally was quite a good starting point um, for, for developing my practice. Also working in education has really pushed my research, it's meant I've travelled a lot, um, networking, meeting different researchers and different academic institutions across the world. I think that has also really pushed me to keep researching and being aware of what's happening and pushing my own practice as well. Um, I think that uh, I'm just going to talk through the kind of design artwork that I make, the installation artwork, and then consultancy workshops. Basically, I make design artwork, which is either bespoke or licensed, um, and the installation work, which is sometimes permanent, sometimes disappears and perishes within a few hours. And I run consultancy workshops with architects, designers, and curators. Um, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about these scraps. I never use notes. This is like. Um, so the design work for private clients uh, and corporate companies across the world. I have found this work through showing trade shows, through exhibitions with print studios, through live making events, exhibitions for those screen print at an event, um, and through working with interior designers. And some of the work is selected straight from my portfolio. Other work is developed with a design team, um, thinking about different uh, ideas for the to produce a range, to colour sampling, through different papers, finishes and approaches. So you can see some of the work in, in different stores and places. And then I also will license the site. So sometimes they take a straight from my portfolio and they are um, perhaps uh, personal projects and other times they work with me specifically for a commission, um, some of these book covers. That's, uh, and I'll also license the sites and I've licensed work to cash food stores um, and I'll also work uh, selling the sites which won't have my name on them which will be uh, sold direct to the textile companies as well. So I kind of have quite a wide range of um, practice in selling and working in kind of commercial situations with these sites. From making that work, um, I, I kind of just like to kind of put in little points and put it on the way of um, Going to break it up was to try and show my work in person. I try and invite people to come to my shows and show that my portfolio was in, in person. I think the work is it's hand screen printed wallpaper showing it digitally, showing it um, over the internet doesn't really work. You have to come to the studio and be 
we, we can actually printing this stuff, feel it, touch it, hold it, look at it, see it in different lights, see the mixture of different um, surfaces together. Uh, and that tends to work best in actually showing the work and um, finding commissions. Uh, I work making a contract, I always make an acceptance of order, determining times, results, prices, and payment methods. I've worked with a lawyer to try and put something like that together. Um, I, I record my making processes, I show that part of it, the fact that it doesn't come off a machine, the fact it's not in a factory is important to getting the story across what they're making and the fact that it can be made with specific orders and colours and things. So I tend to um, always show the processes or record the processes of the making and I write a diary and I wish someone had told me years ago, write a diary at the end of the project because it's lovely having people say how you have to cost things up and how many hours it'll take you to do it and all the costs for all the studios and the materials. You must write one at the end which says you didn't do it in four days, you did it in 17. <laughs> you didn't do it, you forgot to add the bath and you never did the carriage and you didn't think about boxes and you didn't think all of these other things. Because had I known that, I think I would have much more confidence in asking for the correct price. I think it would give me confidence in knowing, do you know what, I did get it right when I cost the whole project up. It was the right price. I don't care that the eyebrows hit the ceiling and they told them what the price was. I know that that would actually pay me for the amount of work I put in and the amount of time I put in to make it and amount of materials it cost me. So I think writing a review in your diary of everything that happened at the end of a project gives you confidence in the future for the next project. Um, and keep in touch with people when you meet them at exhibitions. I've really had work years later from people that have pulled out a catalogue from a show I did three, four, five years ago and gone, yeah, I've been having this to my desk and now who would like to invite me to make a collection? <coughs> no one has that catalogue. It's really interesting to see that they have kind of kept it up. I mentioned that when I graduated from my master's, I had a film and a book and I made this piece of work about sugar being danced on and it was about um, wearing uh, patterns and the idea that pattern was used to hide tracking um, in spaces and in, in public spaces in carpets and I worked for a carpet manufacturer making carpets that were very patterned and the floor being the most touched space in the room I was really interested in developing work about touching the floor and about patterns being worn in uh, to, to tracking um, and so I made this work where people danced on sugar and the sugar goes into the air and covers you. And everyone gets a bit wired and full of sugar during the event. <laughs> and I started making them. One, the first one was my mum and dad's feet in Scotland. The second was in Brixton. And people came in from the street and danced on it. And I filmed it on the CCTV because I knew the caretaker. And the next one was in Lithuania, where every time I make it, I make it patterns from the plates from around where, where the people are dancing. And I started to make these, and these are over years, but I was still designing and printing wallpaper and making wallpapers, and then I made it to the DNA, and it was 11 meters square, and people danced, and you can see the track of the dance of uh, Beanie's Waltz being, being put in the circle of eight. Um, and, and everyone kind of gets a bit, a bit sugary, and that work <laughs> developed very much over time and was very slow and um, was very cheap to make, and that it's a bag of icing sugar, me, and a hand cut stencil. Um, but I slowly learned in planning, coordinating, printers and kind of getting bigger and bigger with practice from a car park to a very big gallery having to have a mark by kind of um, mosaic floor cover. Um, so it's kind of built over time learning as I went along to each project. And from that project I was commissioned to make this project which was to the commission was to engage local people in the Sheffield Millennium Gallery which is kind of on the street. Um, someone from Sheffield in the back. Um, <laughs> this kind of street running through the gallery which links two parts of the city. Um, to work alongside the architecture, to work in materials that would be suitable for a public space for a long period of time. And I was in charge of the fabrication installation, thinking about things like health and safety for 40,000 people to walk over it. And so, kind of, I learned, they, they actually asked saw me at the sugar floor and they said they'd come in um, and they funded a little to do a proposal and I made a book about a dining table and I made a massive kind of mess with spaghetti, trying to eat spaghetti balls with a whisk. And kind of trying to come up with this story, this idea about the piece of work, and also testing ideas with different materials. It's actually made of um, grip tape, which is that stuff you use on skateboards. It's also stuff that's actually stuffing downstairs in a factory, and it's printed with flock. So it's actually really, really rough sandpaper with really, really soft black, black on black. So you can see all these patterns on it when you're standing on it. Um, you can't see them this out, so just, it just looks like solid black. Um, and from that, then I, 
Lady Jane, and she commissioned this piece of work for Tapestry Castle, which was based on another famous piece of work based on ceramics and glass found at the excavation site of this castle. And we worked with local volunteers, students, retired residents, RAA local, and um, people working in the area to cut uh, this pattern into the grass. And when the shadow was happy to this side, we would find the castle open, and when the shadow was the other side, the pattern the castle closed at that time in August, and the local people we're all coming along and cutting in, and we had to think about actually making something outdoors in August, England, which means it rains, and we were trying to pull tents out moats when we blew in there, and it was all really interesting kind of learning of contingency planning, um, and it was funded through the Arts Council and the National Trust, um, and it was again a project that I was invited then to make, having made the kind of over many years of sugar floor and getting slowly bigger in making pieces of work.
and see it through fresh eyes with them. Um, but and that's it at night. So when you switch the lights on, it all blows up. And then this piece is in a permanent piece of work. So I kind of moved from making kind of more permanent pieces of work. That work had probably been there for about three years, the piece before. To making more kind of permanent pieces of work. This is for a residential community style hospital that's been built to replace a 150 year old um, psychiatric hospital. Uh, the piece of work was to be based on local, um, local area. And so I was looking at the landscape of the area and I used foils in it to reflect the natural light and suggest any movement and there's tech out of the wall at different depths. Um, and I put together slides of how it would look and how it would work. And it was really interesting meeting a friend beforehand and went, where's your model? <laughs> what model? <laughs> You've got to have a model. Like, if you're trying something like this, you've got to have a model. And I turned up with this ridiculous size model because I had no concept of scale, obviously, when I'm making my first ever model. To kind of, I thought everyone hold it above their heads and go, yes, I understand how this will work in a space, right? And it was really interesting. It also took a log that I had painted blue to show what a log would look like painted blue. <laughs> because <laughs> it's sometimes weird if you're just like, showing people like, a little drawing and then expecting them to imagine exactly what this will look like that they should be they're backing into this thing, they've, they've, they've seen a couple of little drawings of and so it was really interesting to go along with kind of different materials and talk through. It had been a public call and then went to I think 10 people who were funded to make proposals and then from those 10 people then you got to make the work. So it was kind of a process um, that you went through in, in actually doing it. Uh, I also had to facilitate and develop workshops with local residents or uh, service users and staff at the hospital. And from that, we did lots of modern painting. So the patterns that are on all the leaves are by the people who live there. And so it's their patterns that have then been enlarged and printed in the gold onto all the leaves. And you see them or don't see them depending on the light. And um, in the I hope there's my model. So is it still there? It's still, yeah, it's permanent. It's, it's still in the hospital. Yeah, but it's, it's in the hospital, so it's hard to go to visit. Um, I learned about fabrication and budgets and installations and durability and fire retardancy and relatively maintenance free artwork pieces and health and safety and infection control. So it was a learning curve, let's say. Um, I worked with site engineers and uh, worked with the art um, fabricator, Robin Crowley, to make the piece and I produced a maintenance manual on how to dust it um, in the future. Um, <laughs> I also learned, I learned for risk assessments. I went through all of these different things um, to do this piece, and I'm kind of not going to talk about this piece of time, because I kind of, after doing each of these pieces, and starting with an bag of icing sugar, and um, slowly working up to making a piece from a kind of cream into, <laughs> into a hospital lighting well, I think I've, I've kind of gone quite quickly in, in over, over 10 years in learning um, how, how to kind of develop this work. And I think being open to traveling and working collaboratively is so important. If you don't want to do that, this isn't, you know, this is, I've really been passionate about and go over I think there's an interesting project and I'm really happy to, to go and do that and, and go away for, for days to go and work. Um, and I really love meeting new people and working with people who have interesting ideas and are really great to work with. So it's been, I think that's really important. Um, I've invested time in projects that I'm interested in. I don't apply to things. I don't just scatter apply to everything. I really look for projects I think will be really exciting and I can really put something exciting into. And um, I ask lots of questions when I'm writing the project the proposals. I'll phone them up, I'll ask about it. You sometimes get a little more information if you talk to someone about it and they know your work. Maybe you can introduce your work and you find out what they're kind of looking for. Um, and I think it's important to really make it as easy as possible for the person who's actually uh, doing the funding or selecting the work to, to really clearly show that you've looked at what their aims and targets are and found that how you could meet them or how your work would be excellent in this piece. So really kind of, you've got to read very carefully what they're looking for or talk to them about it for that. I already mentioned samples and models and things. Ask for professionals help. If you don't know about health and safety or engineering or insurance or contracts, <coughs> talk to lawyers, talk to curators, talk to experienced artists. I've learned so much from talking to other artists from getting in the car and going, yeah, I would love a left home. So it's like not in the right direction. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna pick your brain on, you know? And I've learned from people and, and people have been so generous with their time, with their with the experiences in, in, in 
sharing that information and talking to me about projects I've been working on, whether it be how to work with contracts or how to price my work. Um, so I think really just asking people and talking to people and building that relationships is so would be key. Um, when you're proposing in, like, engagement activities, make sure they're fun, make sure they capture the imagination of the participants and explore the themes, but be flexible and responsive because I've worked with people who have all different types of scale levels within a group even, and um, I think it's important to be really flexible and, and know the key points of what your funders want to out of the workshops, know what you would like to out of the workshops, and know what your participants are being offered to do the workshops and what they will get out of it. But it's being flexible to that kind of so it can grow and change with the participants there. Um, and record your work, keep diaries, keep a book of quotes when you're doing workshops, um, work with a photographer who you briefed really well and understanding what the outcomes of that project will be and what you're looking for in the photographs. Um, because you sometimes will need them for a funders report at the end, and so it can be really important to work with. Um, in summing up, I've had projects that have been really varied. Some of them have been really defined, some of them have been really amazing free range on. Free range on. Um, they've been wide and their have has changed and they've got larger as they've gone along. And I've learned from each one, but also as the economy has changed, I've not done all of this at the same time. Sometimes <coughs> I've been more doing the, the wallpaper, sometimes I've been more doing the artworks. Um, it's, it's, it's changed and developed over, over a long period. Uh, I think really just um, challenge yourself as you go along and keep researching, keep finding out and being interested in going along to as many different things as possible because you never know that the person sitting the person sitting on the train once it turned out to be that fabricator. <laughs> so you never know, you know as you keep going along um, how you will meet those people and form really important relationships and and, and uh, these will kind of grow in the future many years from now. Thanks. <coughs>